Good evening, everybody. I trust you had a good day. All uh, y'all came out to church service this morning. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Spirit of the Lord moving. Uh, those of you who tuned in this morning uh, for YouTube or Facebook and was able to watch the recording, we pray that it blessed you too. I'm grateful to be able to come tonight and uh, as we continue our study in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So we will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we're going there's only 13 verses we'll be looking at all those verses in first corinthians chapter 5 and i'll also be in uh, romans chapter 12 verse 1 i'll make a reference to also first corinthians chapter 6 um, verse 19 first corinthians chapter 6 13 b the second part of that verse and we'll also be looking at matthew 18 verses 15 through 17 and romans 6 1 and 2 so you can jot those down, and um, as we go through tonight, you'll be able to turn and um, see as as we go through those verses, and and not just fully trust on what I'm saying, um, that we can see with your own eyes. So I encourage you to have your Bible out and uh, read along with me as we go through this. Now let us go to uh, the Lord in prayer, and then we'll dive into what God has for us tonight. Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to look into your Word. Father, we're grateful that you loved us so much that you sent your, die, your son to die for us, Lord, to shed his blood to pay for our sins. And Father, that you send us this, Lord, this book, the Bible, Lord, that's been put together, contain your love letter to us. Father, we might know you. Father, we might know your love for us. Father, we might know how to come to Jesus and get saved. So, Lord, we just pray that as we go through the message tonight, Lord, that you would speak, that you would get me out of the way, I'm behind the cross, and that your word would go forth, Father, as you'd have. Anything I need not say, Lord, keep me silent. And Father, those things that need to be said, Lord, help me to speak boldly. And Father, I love you and give you glory. <clears throat> For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, and again, we said we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I want to start with verse 11 uh, to show you exactly who Paul is writing and referring to, so there's not any confusion as to what's going on. Remember, Paul's been writing to the Corinthian church, and he had been addressing those that were uh, followers of men and just having troubles with issues with pride, and he, he jumps into another topic now, and it, it still stems, or there's still some reprimanding for pride that's going on. So if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, Paul writes, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or extortioner, with such a one know not eat. I see Paul's telling us that anyone that's called a brother, and that goes for sisters in Christ too, any part of the brethren, that is, that's someone who's been born again, part of the church, that if we know such a one that's living in a way that's contrary to the Bible, and I'm not talking about, you know, a little sin here, or there's no sins, a little sin, but a mess up here and a mess up there. I'm talking about someone that's overtly living in sin, that we're not to keep company with those. Um, and that's what he's referring to, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that are overtly living in sin, we're not to keep company. Um, I remember Paul's writing to a Christian church member. Uh, he's, re he's not referring to the lost. He's not referring to those in the world that don't know Jesus as their Savior. Um, those we might come in contact uh, with a daily basis as we navigate this life. If he was talking about those, we'd have to lock ourselves away and never be able to witness. So he's strictly talking about uh, a, a church member. So let's go back and... Um, we'll get back on verse 11 a little bit later. I just want to clarify the audience here. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1 and 2. And Paul writes, It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have its father's wife. As you are puffed up and have not rather mourned, that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. 
And I want to clarify, fornication is any sexual relationship that takes place outside the bond of marriage. Um, what takes place between a husband and a wife, well, that is holy and that is blessed by God. That's designed by God. God created marriage, one man, one woman, and that the man and the woman come together as husband and wife for uh, procreation and for the enjoyment of one another within the marriage. And outside of that is fornication and it goes against God's word. So Satan has taken what God has created and he's twisted it for the uh, wicked demise of man. You know, Satan's always got an answer or, or, or a counterfeit to what God offers. And of course, for the bondage of one man and uh, one, excuse me, the bonds of one man, not bondage, the bonds of one man and one woman in marriage, uh, Satan has taken and just totally messed all that up and we see nowadays there's all kind of definitions uh, or trying to make definitions of marriage and uh, sexual or morality just runs rampant but Paul gets the word that there's a son out there's having a sexual relationship with his stepmom um, as the reference of his father's wife indicates that this this uh, woman is not the birth mom um, it is a stepmom. But what's even more striking about the whole situation is if that's not bad enough, it was reported commonly. In other words, the church knew what was going on. Uh, the church was tolerating blatant sin. And it was though uh, it was as though tolerance, uh, remember this with, within the congregation of believers, that tolerance was exalted above holy living. Now, don't get me wrong. As a Christian, we ought to be tolerant of any sin. But how we relate to the lost is different than how we relate to our Christian brothers and sisters. The lost world needs to hear that sin is sin, but that there's a God that loves them and sent his son, Jesus, to die for them. The lost world needs to hear, repent, and believe. But the brethren, they've already heard. They've already repented. It, and as he's talking to a church member and talking to one that's in Christ, it's someone that's been born again, know Jesus as their Savior, had a repentance and believed, and is now required to um, as we come to know Jesus our Savior, we're now required to present our body as a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable. Uh, and that's Romans 12, 1. But in Paul writes in Romans, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, with your reasonable service. So as we go through our life as a born-again believer, as a child of God, we're to present our body each and every day as a living sacrifice. God says it's holy. We need to be holy. We need to be acceptable in Him and how we live. In other words, not living to the flesh, but living into the spirit. And it says that's our reasonable service. That is the most reasonable thing we can do as a born again believer. It should not be unreasonable to uh, die to fleshly desires and fleshly lusts that we might serve God. And yet we see so many Christians struggle with walking in a holy manner. And don't, don't get me wrong, the temptation's out there and, and the enemy knows our weaknesses and he's going to be sure to, to make sure those weaknesses come our way or those temptations come our way to our weakness because um, the, the, the enemy's excited when a child of God falls. Um, when a child of God falls in a temptation and uh, it makes his testimony weak. Uh, makes ten, sometimes it just totally uh, destroy a testimony of a Christian. But uh, thank God for mercy and grace, and and, Lord, and that when we repent, that we can come back to to God and have our fellowship restored. Now the born again believer's body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit. First uh, Corinthians six and nineteen. Again, Paul writes, "What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? And is it is to honor God? Um, we're to live for God, not for fleshly gratification." First Corinthians six thirteen b. The second part of the verse is, "Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body." And it, it's 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 sad that. Um, Christians today, that so many of them are living in fornication. Uh, those that uh, there's a lot of young folk will get together and and live together, and they they won't get married, and, and they still come to church and think that they're okay in their walk with God. And, uh, they may be born again, but they're not walking right, not walking the way <clears throat> they should be. Um, God's not okay with the what's meant for marriage done outside of marriage. And so it's something that we want to be close to God that we need to watch and we need to take care of. 
So there is a born again believer um, that is strayed from his walk with God and he's given in to fleshly temptation. And I don't know if it was a quick fall or a slow fall. And I'd have to imagine that it was probably a slow fall. And, and usually when we wrap, get wrapped up into a sin, it's a slow fade. It's a compromise here. A little compromise there is not something that we just dive into. And uh, I don't know what the situation was in the house, how long the dad was gone. I don't know what the mom was doing. don't know what the son was doing. None of that we're told about, but we are told that he's fornicating with his stepmom. And so and this wasn't just a moment of weakness now. This is now full-blown living in it, and it's being reported all over the church, and it's basically been accepted. Oh, my goodness. Church, we must never accept when a believer is walking uh, perpetually in sin. Uh, we, we need to come beside that person and, and try to... Uh, bring them back to the point where they repent and get their life right. So it's not a moment of weakness and fall and then a repentance. It was a blatant act taking place repeatedly and apparently boasted about as the congregation knew exactly what was going on. And so Paul begins by reprimanding the church for its acceptance. Nah, <laughs> it's prideful allowance of this ungodly behavior. He tells them they should be mourning over such behavior. You know, this should bring the church to a grieving um, that such has taken place with one of its members. One of our, when one of our church members, when one of the body of Christ is, is living in a way that's contrary to the God's uh, way of living, it should bring us to, to mourning. It should hurt us. You know, as we see blatant sin living out in our brother's and sister's life, we need to hold them accountable. We need to seek to restore them. You know, so many times, you know, uh, folks will sure enough see something in somebody else. And rather than trying to restore them, um, all of a sudden, we got to be spiritual and call around and have a prayer request. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Hey, did you hear about, so I got a prayer request. Oh, so-and-so was, the brother so-and-so was out doing this. And it turned into a prayer request. But folks, it's nothing more than gossip when we should be seeking the restorations of our brother and sister that might have fallen. And we need to think that way and consider that way lest we ourselves fall you know it's it's just a matter of uh, one moment where the flesh could slip in and, and we could all fall into that temptation so that we need to have our eyes open and need to be awake and, and watching so that we don't fall to the attack of the enemy and need to help our brothers and sisters you know, Jesus gave had to handle this whole church discipline. Um, this fella here, that's, that's the son that was um, in this relationship with his stepmom, he, he was past the point of um, talking and, and past the point of he was ready to repent. Um, he was boasting about the things that were going living in blatant sin. And obviously he's a born again believer um, because Paul is writing to as such and God allowed him to write about this. Now, Jesus gave how to handle church discipline in Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 17. And if you'll flip there, we'll look at that real quick. Uh, and Jesus spoke and he said, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with uh, thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Uh, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. You know, when we know that one of our brothers and sisters is caught up in something, we're to approach him uh, alone. We don't need to, to call and get these prayer requests going on. We don't need to gossip about that. We need to approach him and say, hey, look, uh, this is going on in your life. And that's not what God wants. And you, you need to you turn back to God and get right. I love you. And I want to I want to see you living right for God. You know, and if that fails and we're, to, we're then we can go get a couple of and I wouldn't just grab anybody. Go to a couple of trusted leaders and have them come with you and approach that one. And if that person still refuses to repent, get right, then they're to be brought before the church and it's to be let known what's going on. In this case of the Corinthian church, the whole church already knew what was going on. And yet, rather than seek restoration, they were glorying in their tolerance of such. So finally, if that offender refuses to repent, that brother in Christ, refuse, sister in Christ, refuses to get right with God, it will be removed from the congregation and touch such time that repentance is sought. And at that time, when, when the, the one who's been caught up in, in that sin for so long, when they finally decide that they want to get right with God and, and have a restored relationship with God and, re, and repent, 
then as a church, it's our job to be ready to receive the repentant sinner back in, uh, the repentant brethren back in, and we're to welcome them back in the congregation, not to look down on them with judgmental eyes. Remember, we got to consider what's going on, lest we ourselves fall into the same temptation or into some sort of temptation that may even be worse. So even in the removing or the withdrawing from the offending believer, the purpose is for restoration, and it must be done in meekness and love. 1 Corinthians 5 and 3, Paul writes, For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present, concerning him that had done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you gathered together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Now before I get into that a little bit, I want to, you know, <laughs> We need to be careful about getting down on, on our brother and sister when they're caught up doing something they're not supposed to. I mean, there may be some physical, but Jesus also condemned things that go on in our mind, uh, thoughts that we have. And you know, while we may not be living out such a way, our minds could just be so filthy or so wrong that we're just as guilty as that brother or sister that's living in such uh, in such a sin that it's, that it's made its way out their life. We could have that mind within us. So we need to be real careful what we do. Now, Paul is talking about once uh, once the withdrawing or the removing of the fender, that God will turn over that person to the destruction of the flesh, um, that the spirit might be saved. And boy, that's scary to think that God will take his hand off of one of his children and allow Satan to have his way with that person's body. You know, God allows for the fleshly destruction to take place in one of his children that refused to get right with him and continues to walk in outright disobedience. And this is done... Um, this is this is done not that all Christians, not that all Christians who suffer from a bodily disease or an illness is because they're living in sin. So let's not try to pass that on someone. And and sometimes you know one's one's ridden with a disease or or illness because it's it's for a trying of one's faith, or or maybe it's for growth, or or maybe it's just for God's glory. And sometimes it's just because this old body is appointed once to die. So just because somebody's going through a bodily sickness or illness, we're not to pass judgment and say, oh, must be because such and such wouldn't, so and so wouldn't get the, the right in, in God's sight, and now they're paying for it. No, that's not always the case, but it definitely is the case sometimes. So Paul has already pronounced judgment on this non-repentant church member as though he were there in person and expects the church to carry out the sentence. But looking at that, I want you to notice the wonderful security of the believer. You know, the body is given to the destruction of the flesh. Um, it's allowed for Satan to uh, take care, send all kind of things to the body. Um, to And God allows this to try to draw that sinner back. But I want you to know that Satan cannot touch the spirit. <laughs> As a born or being, being again believer, Satan has no power of your spirit. Satan can't touch your spirit. And you see where Paul wrote, that uh, the one that was delivered over destruction of the flesh, the spirit is saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I mean, what a, what a wonderful uh, pronouncement of the security of the believer. That just because there's one who's caught up in sin and just can't seem to get to victory because they haven't repented, that they're not cast out. They're not cast out before God. And though they'll have uh, fleshly destruction here, though they'll have judgment pronounced upon the flesh, that their soul belongs to God. I want you to get saved. Amen. You're always saved. And I'm so glad that I can't lose my, my sonship and my father. And, and though uh, the flesh perish, that soul is going to reside in heaven. So does this mean we can go ahead and fulfill the fleshly desires, knowing our soul will still belong to God? <laughs> Romans 6, verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You know, absolutely not. Now, just because we've been born again, that does not give us the right. And, and just because we can't lose our salvation, that doesn't give us the right to go and sin all we want. Don't frustrate God's grace. For many a believer has left this world too soon because they would not stop living after the flesh. Again, not every Christian who dies young is because of unrepentant sin. So what is the purpose of withdrawing and removing the unrepentant believer? Well, 
Have you ever heard the phrase that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link? Having a church member living in open, overt sin is detrimental to the ministry of the church. The Holy Spirit will not have freedom to work as he should. God's presence will not be as close to the church as it should be. With God's hand removed from the church, the church is susceptible to unfiltered attacks from Satan. The church will become a lame duck, as it will no longer be fulfilling its purpose of making disciples and leading the lost to Christ. Excuse me. Paul continues in, in verse 6. Verse 6, 7, and 8, he says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. Excuse me, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Furthermore, sin spreads when not kept in check. And the glorying of the Corinthian church on the matter was definitely not keeping anything in check. And sin was spreading rampantly. And as pride was overtaking the once humble believers. I mean, Paul were already reprimanded about their pride. And I don't know which sin came first. If it was the pride and the men followers and they became weak. And then this young man got caught up with his stepmom or if that. I don't know what took place first. But it's evident that the church was ridden with sin because they wouldn't keep it in check. They wouldn't keep their walk right. They were allowing it to take place. You know, scripture reference to the leaven is equated with sin. And just as a little leaven can cause a lump of dough to rise, so too does just a little sin spread and cause more sin within the congregation. And Paul reminds the church that we aren't supposed to feast or live with the old leaven. That's the old sinful ways, but with the unleaven. And that's the righteous living in Christ. And so as we feast on the unleaven. We live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So for the sake of the church and prayerfully for the sake of the unrepentant member, that one is to be cast out to stop the spread of sin, to protect the ministry of God's church, and to encourage the one to repent and return to both God and the congregation. And so I talk, I, I beg you tonight, Christian, if there's something you're wrapped up, something you're having trouble getting the victory over, that you lay it down before God, that you not allow it to have any more place in your life, that you ask God to take that from you, and you just completely let him have it. Let it go. Get rid of it. Set it down at the foot of the cross and let it stay there. Set it upon the altar and let it stay there. Don't take it back with you. Walk in the ways of God. Walk in the ways of Christ. Finally. Verses 9 through 13, Paul writes, I wrote unto you an epistle not to accompany with fornicators. Yet not all the gator, not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or with the extortioners, with the idolaters. For then much he needs to go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or extortioner, which such a one know not to eat. Folks, don't even eat with the one who's living in overt sin, the, the born again believer. Paul says, For what have I do to judge them also that are without? Paul said, I'm, I'm not to judge those that are outside the church. He says, do not ye judge them that are within. You're supposed to judge those within. As a church, as a believer, we're to judge those within our congregation. But it's God, in verse 4, but them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. He said, I'm not talking about those outside the church. I'm not talking about the lost world. God's going to judge them. If they don't come to know Christ as their Savior, they'll be judged, and they'll have to pay for their sin. He said, I'm talking about the born-again believer that's not getting right. Put that one among, away from among you so that sin doesn't run rampant in the church. Uh, Paul clarifies her writing not to company with fornicators, covetousness, extortioners, idolaters, a reference to church members, not the lost world. I uh, just want to, I know I said that several times and I want to be clear. Otherwise, Paul writes, the born again believer would have to be, uh, would have to remove oneself from the world completely. You know, if we were, if we were, if he was talking about the world, he would have to completely remove ourselves from the world. You know, it's not wise to partner with the loss in, in business or in marriage. It's, it's not a good choice. Um, if, if you're going to open a business with someone and you're going to become business partners, it's a good thing that, that you both be Christians um, so that you have the same mind and definitely the same master. Um, if you partner with the lost, then, then you're asking for trouble. Same thing goes for marriage. And if there's anyone listening that, that's not married, uh, consider this before you get married. Make sure that the one you're wanting to be your husband or your wife 
that they know Jesus Christ is their Savior. One of the hardest things, this, you know, this world is hard enough on a marriage, the way society is. Um, the way things are right now, it's hard enough on a marriage when two people know Jesus Christ, when they're in love with one another, they have the same master and they have the, um, that bond of Jesus between them that's brought them together. There's enough troubles in this world to strain that marriage. But if you take one that doesn't know Jesus and you take one that does know Jesus and you make a bond there, you have someone that has two different masters. One's master is Christ and one's master is Satan. And you're asking for trouble. Make sure, young folk, if you're listening, that the one that you're seeking to be your spouse, that they know Jesus Christ is their Savior. You know, we have to live out our Christian life in this lost world so that they can see our witness, so they can see Jesus, so that the lost world can come to Jesus. It is the mission of the church to go out into the lost world and to preach and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not to hide ourselves from the world, but we're to go out into the world and preach the gospel. That doesn't mean we're to go out and live like the world. That doesn't mean we're to go out and partner with the world. That doesn't mean that we just go out and live in any which way that feels good. But it means that we go out and let Jesus Christ shine from our life so that the lost world would be drawn. Just like that old lighthouse that's on the, the bay and that, that stormy night. When that ship is looking and it's getting close, they see that lighthouse and know that there's danger. Well, to this lost and dying and dark world, it's the light of Jesus Christ that needs to shine out and let them know that there's danger, that there's something lurking up ahead that can destroy them. There's something lurking up ahead that means imminent doom. And for the lost, that's hell. That's the lake of fire. And so, folks, we need to, Christians, we need to be that beacon. We need to be that lighthouse that shines. And we can't do that if we're too busy guiding our light covered up. If we're too busy living like the world, then we might as well just be a lighthouse that's burnt out for the lost, impending doom, destruction. Well, that lighthouse is okay. That lighthouse is still safe and secure. <laughs> but that ship that's out there wondering, hmm, pending doom. Folks, let your light shine. Don't worry about judging the world. Let God judge the world. But let the world see Jesus Christ in you. Let them see there's something different. Let them see, uh, let them know what sin is and that, that their sin needs to be repented of and that their sin needs to be forgiven and that God sent Jesus to die for their sins. And church, let us hold each other accountable. Let us worship and serve the Lord together so that we might be strengthened and encouraged to keep up the good fight, to keep on living the truth, and to keep on preaching the gospel, <laughs> and to see another lost soul saved. Folks, that's why we're still here. That's why we're not taken out of this world, so that we continue to be a witness. So walk each day in the light of the Father, in the light of Jesus. Keep your fellowship strong with him. If you happen to mess up, ask God to forgive you. Don't let it grow and grow and fester. Don't let it be to where you keep falling into it. Eventually you're living in sin. But repent and turn from it. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've heard me say seven, several times that you need to repent of your sins. Jesus died for you. He shed his blood. You know, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. We deserve death because of our sin. And for the lost sinner, that death is an eternal separation from God. Eternal separation from God that will be in a place called hell. That will be cast into the lake of fire. Darkness, heat forever and ever away from the presence of God. To be reminded and think about every sin that you ever did over and over and over. No, it won't be a party. No, you won't see your friends. It'll be torment forever. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to make you think about the judgment that's coming from Almighty God. Not from fellow, not from Christians walking this world, but the judgment's coming from God himself. If you don't know Jesus Christ is your Savior, what's stopping you? Repent. That means turn from your ways. Turn to God's ways. Recognize that he is righteous. He is holy. And what he says is true. 
Trust on Jesus Christ as your Savior. Believe what Jesus did for you, that he died and shed his blood to pay for your sins, that he arose the third day, and he's living with the Father now, preparing a place for us. And then ask him to save you. He said he would. Thank you tonight for joining in. And if you just ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I ask you to let us know. Send us a message. Call us. Email, text. Let us know you trusted Jesus, your Savior. If you want to know more, contact us. Let us know. We would sure love to talk to you more about it. Well, folks, let's close tonight. Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to look in your word. Father, thankful how you're always, Lord, seeking the lost. Father, thankful for how you're always wanting a fellowship with your children. Oh, Lord, sometimes we fall. Father, we're grateful that you don't just cast us out when we fall. Lord, that you forgive when we ask forgiveness. That you love when we don't deserve it. Father, I'm grateful for that. Lord, help us to go forward in a way that glorifies you. We love you and give you praise tonight. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, God bless.